check one, two, three, chair. We are ready. We may proceed. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, and greetings uh, to everyone. Um, in keeping with that tradition, uh, I'll start by bowing to, to my right and bowing to my left. Um, honorable members, um, uh, we got a message that Honorable uh, Mukause lost a son. Uh, most sincere condolences uh, to the family. Um, uh, and, and, and having made this announcement, uh, we will then proceed to observe a moment of silence uh, for prayer uh, or meditation. Thank you very much. Um, having done so, uh, let us be reminded that uh, the rules uh, apply uh, and that the processes for the virtual sitting are also applicable. Um, before we, we proceed, I'd like to remind you of the, the following that uh, the sitting constitutes a sitting of the National Council of Provinces, that the place of the sitting is deemed to be Cape Town, where the seat of the National Council of Provinces is, that delegates in the virtual sitting enjoy the same powers and privileges that apply in the sitting of the National Council of Provinces, that for the purpose of the quorum, all delegates who are logged on to the virtual platform shall be considered uh, present. That delegates must always switch on their videos. That delegates should ensure that the microphones of their, on their gadgets are muted and must always remain muted unless you have uh, permission to, to speak that the interpretation facility is active and, and that any delegate who wishes to speak must use the raise your hand function. And as well as say, uh, hoping that uh, uh, and trusting that uh, members are very, very familiar with the raise your hand uh, function. Honorable members, uh, we will now move on to notices of motions and uh, motions without notice. Uh, we shall therefore proceed to notices of motions um, uh, and delegates who wish to give, give a notice of motion should use the raise your hand function. Uh, total time uh, allocated for per motion is one minute. All in all, we have 20 minutes uh, to look at motions. And just want to remind members that uh, if delegates exceed the time of one minute, uh, uh, one and a half minutes, sorry, uh, uh, when the time shall have been to have, been, to have expired, uh, and then and the, and the motions, not of motion, will be printed in full uh, on the next day uh, or the other paper. Uh, are there any notices of motion? Uh, let's start with uh, uh, Gillian. Honorable Gillian. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> Honorable Chairperson, allow me to rise on behalf of the African National Congress 
in the next sitting of this house that this august house notes with concern and disappointment the hypocrisy and double standards of the DA-led Western Cape Provincial Government regarding their public commitment to good governance and the rule of law. According to the report of the public protector that has been made public, the Western Cape MEC for local government, environmental affairs and development planning has indeed interfered with the appointment of key officials in the George local municipality. The report further made recommendations to the Premier of the Western Cape, Alan Windy, to take appropriate disciplinary action against the MEC, Anton Bradial. Despite these findings and recommendations, the DA-led government has decided to ignore the findings and recommendations which according to the Constitutional Court are binding on all organs of state. We therefore call for this House to impress upon the Western Cape Premier Alan Windy to walk the talk by taking appropriate disciplinary action against MEC Bradell. I so move, Chairperson. No, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, any other motion? Notice of motion? Uh, Honorable J.J. Holt. Thank you, Chair. And move, move um, Chair. Since we are doing the notices of motion and the previous one was a motion without notice, I just think we should maybe just um, clarify that. But the notice of motion, um, on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby move that this House debates the current situation around Petro SA, how we have arrived at this point with Petro SA, as well as how its future looks and the impact on the economy in both the national and local sphere in the Southern Cape. I so move. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Honourable Member. Just to say to honorable members, uh, let's please pay attention and ensure that we don't use uh, this space uh, to make lengthy uh, speeches. Uh, uh, we have tended generally to be fairly accommodative uh, and to have everybody on board and so on. So let us not repeat the same mistakes with these guys motions without notice as 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 a, a motion mo notice of motion uh, as, 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 as sorry as, as, as a, a, a not 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 notice with without motion without notice let's let's try and avoid that. Okay. The, 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 the notices the, 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 the notices um, the, of motion should be should be very, very brief. Uh, so let's avoid making speeches. Honorable Muman? Point of order, Chair. Yeah. Chair, if the first statement was a motion without notice, then I would like to object, please. Chairperson, please, it's a motive. It's a notice of a motion, not without a, a notice. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Honourable Gillian did not ask proceed. for a debate, Chair. Honourable Gillian did not ask for a debate. Therefore, uh, it cannot be a notice of motion. Can we have all the members? Uh, Honourable Mwima. Eh, Chalubu Hamudu, you asked you one time to Chava in province. Eh, Honourable Chair, allow me to move a notice of motion on behalf of the African National Congress in the next sitting of this House that one, this August House knows with concern the persistent attack by some quarters of the media and the right wing anti forum brigades against the Minister of Human Settlement, Water and Sanitation. According to the media, uh, Honorable Chairperson, the Afri Forum, a bastion of right wing politics that seeks to preserve the white minority privilege and domination 
peddle the lies that the deployment of the Cuban engineers in the water and sanitation infrastructure revitalization space discriminates against the qualified South African engineers. This is despite the documented empirical evidence that we have seen some element of hesitation uh, on part of some engineers to work in the rural access due to multiplicity of factors prominent amongst which is the lack of infrastructure like the first world-class urban accommodation. Further, that the anti-Cuban sentiment of the Afri Forum is nothing less than the negation of the historical human solidarity between the Cuban, the heroic Cuban people and the South Africa that was forced in the blood in pursuit of liberation of the oppressed African majority of South Africa as displayed in the Quito Carnival battles, amongst others. Therefore, calls on the Minister of Human Settlement and Sanitation to be assured on the support of this House in her endeavor to enlist the general support of the Cubans in addressing the development challenges of our rural masses. I so move, Honorable National Chair. I object, Chair. I object to the motion, Chair. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you very much, Honor Um uh, 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 is, is there any other notice of motion? Chair, Chair, this is not a notice without mo I mean, a motion without notice. This is a notice of motion. So this objection doesn't stand. Thank you, National yeah. Chair. <laughs> Yeah, no, all the other honorable members said, uh, let's, let's move on. Is there any other notice of motion? None. Oh, sorry, there's honorable JJ Long. Thank you, honorable chairperson. Um, chairperson, um, on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby wish to move a motion without notice that this house congratulates. No, still, still not, not of motion. Oh, you said we're moving on, Chair. <laughs> okay, no, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next um, the, the, the part of our work, which is uh, on, 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 on motions without, without notice. Uh, again, one minute per, per, per motion, per motion uh, and all in all, we have 20, 20 minutes. Um, uh, let me look at my list. I can uh, continue the first person on the on the list is is Boshoff. So Thank we'll start much, Boshoff. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, everybody. On behalf of the DA, I have I move without notice that this council notes with concern the continuous complaints from residents within the Tabachero local municipality regarding the dysfunctional wastewater treatment plant. Also notes that this plant has been non-operational for the past four to five years, resulting in the water reserves and the land being severely polluted. This is further compacted by the fact that both sewage plant pumps in Graskop have been dysfunctional for the past two weeks that it be noted that the residents in Graskop were informed by the officials that they have to wait until next week to have the pump fixed. This in itself is abominable. Further notes that all the flows are heavy and chemicals will not help the problem to or rectify the damage done to the fresh water resources. Further notes that according to the National Water Act, this is an offense but yet the pollution continues unabated on a daily basis. Notes with concern that the municipality has been aware of these leaks since 2018, when the DA brought it to the attention of the MEC and the national minister, but yet it has reached this extent. We therefore call on the Minister of COCTA to consult with her counterpart in the province 
to see whether the province is able to assist this failing municipality to ensure that the residents are provided with clean and a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eero uh, Boshoff. Uh, any objection? There being no objection, the motion, the motion to, to proceed with. Uh, 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 and, 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 and thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the next um, uh, uh, motion will come from Honorable, Honorable Fessel. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Thank you, Chair. Um, on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby move without notice um, that this Council notes the increased security risks for all citizens travelling on the N14 through Freiburg in Northwest. These citizens are being attacked in their vehicles and robbed of whatever is visible or accessible. Botswana citizen from Morn, Mr. Smith, was attacked on Sunday, 16 May, and stabbed in the arm and neck whilst traveling through Freiburg. Mr. Smith succeeded in his escape from an attempt to hijack his vehicle. Further notes that crime and criminal activities in Freiburg are beyond control and that the South African police service are under-resourced and understaffed to curb thugs from attacking citizens of which some are seriously injured. Notes with concern that attackers are now grabbing small children from vehicles, stopping at traffic light, lights to obtain access to the vehicles. Notes also that the Northwest MEC of Safety and Security and the South African Police Service in the Northwest has received many complaints over the past four years about the safety and security of citizens in the streets of Freiburg. The situation has still deteriorated. Also notes with concern that tourist companies in South Africa and abroad now warn tourists of the criminality in Freiburg and request that tourists avoid traveling through Freiburg. This is negatively impacting the economy of this country town in terms of restaurants and accommodation facilities, as well as the security of job creation and employment. We further request the employment of the Minister of Police to intervene in Freiburg urgently, restoring the mandate of the South African Police Service to protect citizens and their properties, the attacks on innocent people in, uh, people in Freiburg and the inability of the South African Police Service to comply with their constitutional obligations deserve the Minister's urgent attention. I so move. Thanks. Uh, th th thank you very much. Any, any, any objection to the motion? And there being no, no objection, the motion is agreed to in terms of Section 65 of the Constitution. Next motion, Honorable Lund. Thank you, Chairperson. We, we try again. So, on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I hereby wish to move a motion without notice that this House congratulates governments across the African continent who are working diligently and roll out a proper vaccination program to ensure that their citizens are protected during this pandemic that this House also express its deep concern with those governments who fail to take the well-being of their citizens seriously and put thousands of lives at risk by not being able to have a proper vaccination rollout. That this House also thank organizations who continuously put pressure on the underperforming governments and motivate more people to do so until we have a thorough vaccination rollout that will protect us all. I so move. Thank you very much. Any objection to the motion? Chair, I just want to inquire, if you allow me, please. Is 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 the yeah. as the honourable member said? Can I ask, Chair, if, if you allow me, because I don't want to re, I don't want to speak on the motion without clarity. Has the honourable Lund said in his motion that this government doesn't take uh, his people seriously regarding the rollout of the vaccine? Yeah, I'm sorry, can very that point. yeah, okay. Uh, we can repeat that point. Honorable Lord. Okay, person. Um, so I'll I'll read that again and I'll read it slowly for you. Um, that this house also express its deep concern with these governments who fail to take the well-being of their citizens seriously and put thousands of lives at risk by not being able to have a proper vaccination rollout. 
I can repeat the full one if you want, or if that paragraph is enough, then I'm happy with that. No, no, no. no. Just the we whole again. No, 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 no. We have got the trust. Uh, he's smuggling something. It's incorrect. Uh, I will object the motion. Uh, the motion. Uh, there being an objection, uh, the motion may, may not be proceeded uh, uh, with uh, and will be become a notice of a uh, of a motion. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Marikane. Honorable Marikane. Uh, please proceed. Uh, thank you. I hereby move without notice on behalf of the ANC that the House note that a 50 year old teacher from Bilui Secondary School in Toyando Limpopo was in the dock for allegedly raping a 17 year old pupil on multiple occasions. Further note that the man appeared in Toyando Magistrate Court on Monday on three counts of rape, and the case was postponed to next week, Monday, for him to get legal representation and file a, a formal bail application. Further note that one of the incidents he re reported reportedly offered to assist her, assist her with extra lessons, but instead took her to a lodge where he allegedly raped her. Therefore, commend the police for arresting him and employ them to make sure that the perpetrator is found guilty and sentenced accordingly. I so move. An objection to the motion? Uh, now, uh, and there being uh, no objection, the motion is agreed to in terms of Section 65 of the of the Constitution. Uh, the next person is Honorable Detroit. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I move without notice on behalf of the Freedom Front Plus that this House notes that there is a shutdown in Mangahun that has devastating effects on the economy that the lack of service delivery is being used as an excuse for the reason of the protest, that protest action must not prevent private businesses from doing business as usual, since businesses are already under tremendous pressure and unemployment is at an all-time high, that urgent intervention is needed and politicians must refrain from using the municipal arena as a battlefield for political infighting. I so move. Any objection to the motion? Yes, sir. There's an objection. Uh, uh, so there being an objection, the motion may, be, may not be proceeded with and will become a, not, a notice of uh, uh, a motion. Uh, thank you very much. I see there's a, a last hand there. Andrew Arnold. Please proceed, Arnold. Thank you, Chairperson. I rise on behalf of the economic freedom fighters that the council notes that as a chapter nine institution, the office of the public protector is one of six independent state institutions set up by the country's constitution to support and defend democracy. Notes with concern, the current 28.7 uh, budget cut of the office of the public protector that will have a devastating impact on rooting out corruption. Further notes that in the 2020-2021 financial year, 16.1 million was cut from the office of the public protector. The office of the public protector will be rendered ineffective and will derail the task of fighting corruption, which are threatening the resources of poor South Africans. Acknowledge that the budget cut will hamper the speed of investigations again against corruption and state capture. We therefore call on the government to protect the poor and the marginalized against corruption by strengthening the office of the public protector. I so move. Thank you very much. Uh, any objection to the motion? 
And there being no objection, the motion is, is therefore agreed to in terms of section 65 of the of the constitution. Uh, we are there any other motions that notice? No, no other motion. We'll then move on to uh, the next uh, the part uh, of our work. Um, uh, and, and and we'll proceed to the first order of the of the day. Uh, just with my honourable delegates, uh, that we are now looking at uh, the first order. Uh, but before we proceed to the policy debate, uh, I will take this opportunity to welcome the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, uh, as well as the Minister of Agriculture. Land reform and rural development, uh, uh, as well as their uh, deputies, that is the deputy uh, ministers. Uh, so we'll proceed to the to the first order, uh, policy debate on budget vote number three and and, and fifteen, corporate co co cooperative governance and traditional affairs, respectively, uh, uh, appropriation bill. Uh, B4 2021, uh, National Assembly Section uh, 77. Uh, we will therefore pro pro proceed, and I call upon the Honorable uh, uh, Minister Dr. N.C. Uh, Lamine Zuma, Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, to open the, the debate. Okay. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Chairperson and members of the Select Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, and all Honorable Members, Deputy Minister for Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Minister uh, of Agriculture, uh, Minister Togo Didizaime, Deputy delegates from the provinces, members of the provincial executives, commissioners of the promotion and protection of the rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities, representatives of the Municipal Demarcation Board and the IEC, representatives of the South African Local Government Association, a directors general for the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, CEOs and heads of institutions in our sector, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable members, vote three and 15 set aside 100.8 billion and budget 15, 173.3 million towards our objectives of addressing the issues of hunger, poverty, inequality, and unemployment, and also creating and building resilient, safe, sustainable, prosperous, cohesive, connected, and climate smart communities. Honorable members, we will continue to prioritize our actions in relation to the coordination of the national response to COVID-19. In this regard, whereas we have largely managed to flatten the curve through the implementation of our risk-adjusted strategy, we have lost over 55,000 people. The first and second waves, which we experienced in June, July, December, January, unfortunately claimed the lives of many care, health care workers, uh, frontline workers, uh, the police, the security, uh, the frontline in the municipalities, and many others. And of course, our condolences again go to their uh, loved ones. Judging from the trends of the first and second waves, a third wave is imminent. We must therefore vigilantly adhere to the protocols of masking, washing hands, sanitizing, and maintaining a safe social distance. Even though on Monday we began the second phase of the mass vaccination program, we must bear in mind that we are not safe until we are all safe. 
Honorable members, <coughs> last year's debate, we said we had accelerated the profiling of districts, a greater focus on creating jobs whilst building cohesive, sustainable, vibrant, and connected and climate smart community. At the time, we also spoke on the progress in the pilot sites of Oatambo Waterbeck at Teguin. A central subject of our performance agreement is the delivery of the DDM in the pilots and 23 other districts in the financial year. We are pleased to announce that we have completed the initial drafts of the one plans for 28 of our districts and metros. With all the districts in Pumalanga, Northern Cape Limpopo, and Northwest Dan, we anticipate that all will be completed by the end of the month and will enable us to conduct stakeholder and investor consultations. With regards to the pilot sites, notable progress has been recorded. In Itegwini, for instance, which has been characterized by crime and grime at the time of the launch, through the multi Sphere and Intergovernmental Operation Good Hope, 258 tons of solid waste were removed mainly in the inner city last month alone. This has been complemented by the work done by the city parks and maintenance divisions, which includes grass cutting, tree felling, drain clearance, water pipes, and blocking of the and repair of potholes. We had also spoken of the state of lawlessness in the city. The Integrated Safer City Program Steering Committee, which includes all spheres, meets on a monthly basis. One of the constraints identified by business people was the congestion and crime at the Deben port. This has relegated the port from being the busiest port on the continent to the third busiest port. We constituted a multi-stakeholder task team with Transnet, Deben Chamber of Business, private operators, and the Tracking Association. The team meets monthly under the leadership of the mayor and the champions of and the minister for public enterprise. The team is registering progress. For instance, the average total turnaround time has been reduced to 151 hours, down from 343 hours in March last year. We are not yet there and are far from the 60-hour turnaround time target. We must therefore strive for consistency in our performance and the reduction of the staging time, which constitutes over 54% of the time. We are also registering progress in the 19 catalytic projects, which includes the Deben Film Studio, which is valued at 500 million rands, through 1.6 billion infrastructure investments in the city. 3,900 new jobs were created. The overall investment portfolio was raised from 2.3 billion in the last financial year to 3.5 billion. Honorable members, steady progress has also been recorded in OR Tambo and Waterbeck. Last month, we launched our partnership with the United Nations in OR Tambo, which will render inclusive, just, and sustainable economic growth whilst meeting our obligations of climate resistance resilience and sustainable management of resources. The planned business solution centers will also provide business development services for micro and small enterprises. Our people, particularly women and youth, will have a better chance to gather information as well as access to market skills, financial and capital and, and capital. OR Tambo forms an integral part of our plans to develop the Eastern Seaboard and Rebecca to beyond St. Lucia to provide the necessary infrastructure for our Tambo part of the development. For now, we have set aside 2.9 billion in the MIG over the MTF period. 
In Waterbeck, we intend establishing a global business service outlet, the TVET College there, in partnership with the private sector, which includes the private public growth initiative and Harambi. The lucrative sector currently employs more than 267,500 people, servicing the domestic and international markets to total value of 16 billion. The nature of the work performed in the sector is such that it affords young people without any post-schooling training to access entry-level jobs, which they can perform on-site and increasingly from home if they have access to right technology infrastructure. The medium-term outlook is to add a further 430 additional jobs throughout the country by the end of 2030. Over and above this, we will continue to prioritize the unlocking of the mining, tourism, game, and agricultural sectors through one plans and one budget as facilitated for by the multi-stakeholder district forum. Although the forum has submitted a plan to the province worth $150 million for the establishment of 506 citrus orchards and park house, which will provide 270 full-time jobs. This project constitutes one of the six catalytic projects in the district. The project also includes the Olifants River Water Resource Development, which will bring potable water to the 15,872 households without water, the majority of whom are in the rural areas. The availing of skills and infrastructure investments need to be complemented by the building of the asset base of the poor. We are therefore encouraged by the Department of Land Affairs program for the leasing of state land. The program will avail over 69,000 hectares in 21 state-owned farms, thus enabling the black majority of participate in the agricultural sector whilst improving their income and access to land. The state land lease program will also assist in us to provide a more impactful agrarian revolution program, which we had set aside over 169 million over the past three years. These resources supported 33 projects which are located on traditional land. Unfortunately, the funding has come to an end and any further projects will be supported through the remodeling of the community works program. The community Pro works program will use some of the current NPOs in the interim, but the long-term view is to cut out the middle person and directly support community-based initiatives such as cooperatives and SMMEs. Honorable members, in order to deliver on the promise of the DDM to enhance cooperative governance and integrated development, we must have capable and capacitated municipalities and provinces. The challenge confronting our municipalities and provincial governments are well documented and have led us to institute Section 100 in the Northwest in April 2018. During our last year's adjustment budget, we briefed that at a local government level, these have um, undermined services service delivery and resulted in adverse findings by the Auditor General, which are well known to all of us. We are pleased to announce that through the efforts of the IMTT and the administrators, the province is turning the corner. Amongst other reports, the AG's 2019-2020 findings note, I quote, an encouraging trend. Close quote. According to the AG's report, the province recorded an overall improvement in the number of departments receiving unqualified audits, ending a four-year period of decline prior to the intervention. Eight departments received unqualified audits, up from five in the previous year. Irregular expenditure in care was reduced. Investigations into supply chain management were accelerated. That is not to say the province uh, is... Um, now on a good footing. There are still challenges, but there is progress. 
the appointment of the Director General in the province, as well as heads of departments for health, agriculture, and social development will bring about some stability. It is also our hope that we will fast track the appointment and resumption of duties for the heads of department for the Treasury, Human Settlement, Public Works and Roads, Cocta, Arts and Culture, Sports and Recreation. We have also had several disciplinary processes as part of our consequence management. This has resulted in one dismissal in the Premier's office, eight in the Department of Health, nine in the Department of Public Works and Roads, four in the Department of Community Safety and Transport, and, edu and five in Education. The case against the head for public works and roads entered into the closing argument phase this past Monday, and we are optimistic it will soon be concluded with the appropriate sanctions. The National Treasury and SIU are also concluding further forensic investigations. The National Prosecuting Authority and Direct for Priority Crimes Investigation are currently pursuing 51 cases. To complement this, Asset Forfeiture Unit is recovering stolen or misused funds. In March this year, the President signed the seventh proclamation relating to Northwest. Honorable members, much of the challenges confronting the province and others have to do with the local sphere. We have also seen how that has translated to infighting and underservicing of communities. Despite that underservicing, the municipalities in the Northwest only spend 61% of the 1.7 billion MIG grant. In this regard, the municipality of Ketleng River, Tswaying, Tsobotla, Ramachera Moilwa, Ratlu, Dr. Ruth Khumutso Mompati, Motloseng and Matiben require urgent and added attention. Consequently, we will work with the national and provincial treasuries to consider steps we should take to ensure that the conditional grants are spent and utilized effectively. This may include use, utilizing the tw Section 21 of the Division of Revenue Act. This will enable us to appoint implementing agents such as MISA and DBSA to directly deliver the much needed services. We are also placing a tight eye of scrutiny on J.B. Marx and Mahi Keng because of the infighting, political instability, and alleged misappropriation of funds, and the declining service delivery. The Deputy Minister has convened an internal task team to provide focused attention to these 10 municipalities. The team will also develop a sustainable exit strategy and requisite directives that will use, be used these and other municipalities in the Northwest and the rest of the country to improve on performance. The strategy should also turn the fortunes of the 23 other municipalities under administration, Section 139. The strategy will also provide a more sustainable approach to the court directives presented by the recent concluded case of Ketling River Mafu and, and Ligua. This service delivery uh, in, in these municipalities, service delivery has uh, almost collapsed. Kedlang River, this has resulted in civic organization having to deliver services, and in Ligua, national government has had to intervene to improve services. It will also em help to empower national and provincial actions and directives, which in some instances have been ignored. Honorable members, Interventions under Section 100 and Section 139 ought to be instituted uh, in future as a very last resort. Instead, we must place greater emphasis on Section 154, the section that calls on the, quote, national government and provincial governments to support and strengthen the capacity of municipalities to manage their own affairs, to exercise their power and to perform their functions, close quote. We must promote integration and the spirit of cooperation governance by working as one in the three spheres. I know sometimes uh, when the provinces uh, try to intervene through 154, some of the municipalities fear that they are 
uh, for their powers are being taken, but that's not the case. This is also the spirit carried out in the Municipal Structures Amendment Bill, which has been finalized by Parliament and has been submitted to the President for assent. That spirit is also carried out in the Municipal Systems Bill, which is out for public consultations. These pieces of legislation will improve the local government architecture and will also enable us to tighten governance at the municipal level. Another important piece of legislation is the Traditional and Khoisan Leadership Act, which came into effect on the 1st of April. This will bring to full recognition institutions of traditional leadership in the Khoisan communities. We are currently finalizing the appointment of the related commission as per the legislation. Deputy Minister Bapela is currently leading a national outreach program with MECs, Houses of Traditional Leaders, and representatives of the Khoisan communities to discuss the implementation of the Act. Last year, we also reported that we would host a summit to deal with the second pandemic of gender-based violence and femicide. Indeed, the summit was hosted in August, and as part of the outcomes of the summit, we will this year roll out training to women in the traditional leadership on GPF, working closely with the Commission on Gender Equality, Department of Women, Youth and People with Disability, as well as other relevant stakeholders. The Deputy Minister will elaborate on these and other aspects of traditional affairs. Honourable members, we have for some time now spoken about how we view the current funding model to the to somewhat be unjust. Our discussions with National Treasury are close to conclusion as we consider how we can revise the current funding model so that the more rural and poorer municipalities are not disadvantaged. We will also look at your support in concluding these discussions. South Africa is also um, a disaster averse country with extreme weather conditions which are a result of climate change action failures. As we speak, South Africa is simultaneously confronted by the negative effects of the heavy rains and droughts. Our disaster management architecture will require some strengthening. We will look to the NCOP to support the challenges, to change the changes we will introduce in due course. Uh, I would like to thank all the institutions we have worked with the Deputy Minister, uh, Salga. We also want to thank all the DGs in the department and the CEO and all the officials who um, do the heavy lifting. Uh, we also would like to call on your support in the passing of the budget, vote 3 and 15. I thank you. Album way. Album way. Kamala Makosi Yes, and uh, the next speaker is going to be Honorable Godovu. Chairperson of the NCOP, Honorable Amos Aye. Masondo, Honorable Minister, Dr. Dr. Kosazana Kamini Zuma, and your Deputy Honorable Obed Bapela, Chief Whip of the NCOP, Permanent and Special Delegate, Representative of Salga, ladies and gentlemen, the struggle against colonialism and apartheid and the building of a non-racial, non-sexist democratic society has produced many outstanding leaders. We also have men and women who in a variety of ways have made an important contribution in terms of our own struggle. One of such leaders is Walter Sisulu, a doyen of our struggle, 
who was born on this day, the 18th of May in 1912. Yes. I fighter who has paid a deposit in our moral bank account so that as we move forward to reconstruct and develop our country, we must emulate his virtues and his exemplary leadership. Honorable Chairperson, as we debate vote number three on cooperative governance and, trad and vote 15 on traditional affairs today, I rise to express our fervent appreciation to Baba Walter Sisulu and accordingly wholly dedicate this speech to him for the indelible contribution that he made in bringing about freedom in our land. As we battle to fix local government to ensure that it is indeed a sphere that promotes accountable governance, a sphere that provides basic services to our people, and a sphere that promotes participatory democracy. We must do so in full recognition that we owe a special debt of gratitude to Baba Sisulu because of his immense and immeasurable contribution he made in struggle, but because, but equally because he has enriched our lives with the magic of his words, the acuity of his insights, and the magnitude of his vision. As the Select Committee on COCTA, Human Settlement, Water and Sanitation, we have noted with great concern the appalling state of our municipalities which need urgent intervention. At the heart of this undesirable situation, there are political governance and leadership problems which are causing service delivery delays in most of our municipalities. And they also cause instability, protests, and collapse of many municipalities. Honorable Chairperson, these municipalities are vulnerable as a result of increasing unauthorized, irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure. While some of them are unable to collect revenue, others continue to illegally adopt unfunded budgets with their expenditures exceeding their incomes. The municipalities in rural parts of our country are specifically castrated because of low tax base and lately because of the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, Honorable Chair, they are unable to provide minimum basic services to the people and also they are unable to pay their creditors, including ESCOM and water board utilities, which they owe billions of rent. To compound these problems, corruption and other acts of financial malfeasances have generally collapsed most of the municipalities. And as such, they are unable to implement infrastructure projects leading to delays, incomplete projects, and municipal infrastructure grant diversions. As a result of this, Communities experience infrastructure neglect and rundown, potholes, sewer spillages, as well as water and electricity losses. Honorable Chairperson, during our interaction with the Department of COCTA on its annual performance plan for 2021 and 2022 financial year, it identified the performance indicators and targets that, we, that it will seek to achieve. And this includes the following. In terms of program one administration, the output includes the approval of corporate service improvement plan and the financial management improvement plan, developing the internal audit plan, as well as reporting on investigated matters of corruption. On program two that deals with govern, government, lo, local government support and intervention, the outputs include the following, ensuring the development of one plan of the district development model. In terms of institutional development, which is program three, 
The output includes the following. The municipal viability, the municipal financial viability assessment and improvement tool, increasing efficiency in electricity provision, support, supporting the preparation for local government election, and also ensuring that the municipal public accounts committee committees function optimally and therefore municipalities improve their audit outcomes. And, and on the National Disaster Management Center, the outputs of the department include supporting municipalities in priority disaster areas and reporting on the functions of sector departments, especially those that are implementing the disaster funding arrangement. And lastly, on the community works program, the outputs include the enrollment and training of participants for the community work program and the implementation of the new model of the community works program. In the light of this above point, Honorable Chairperson, we think that this program needs to be attended to and because the select committee is making the following observations, that compensation of employees of the Department of COCTA under the administration program has declined that the department has included gender-based violence in the district development plan, and this is welcomed by the community, by the committee. That there are problems with the aging and, and maintenance of infrastructure and failure by some municipalities to use their municipal infrastructure grants. That there are delays by the department in tabling of the monitoring and intervention bill to give effect to section 100 and section 139 of the constitution, that there are poor or no accountability in most municipalities leading to the deteriorating financial situation, that there is lack of consequence management, that the lack of consequence management has also deteriorated the financial positions of many municipalities, and all of this need to be given the necessary attention. Based on the above observation, Honorable Chairperson, our select committee recommends the following measures, that the Department of COCTA should fast track the tabling of the monitoring and, implement and intervention bill so as to provide guidelines and norms on the invocation of section 100 and section 139 intervention. That the department should provide quarterly progress reports on the implementation and achievement of annual targets as contained in the annual performance plan and the budget of the department itself. And going forward, Honorable Chairperson, our select committee will align its quarterly programs in line with the annual targets of the Department of COCTA in order to ensure the monitoring of performance, ensuring executive accountability, and exercising parliamentary oversight on the implementation of the annual performance plan and the budget of the department. Honorable Chairperson, as I pointed out from the beginning, today is the birthday of Tata Walter Sisuri. He would have been 109 years old, the same as his beloved organization, the ANC. If ever there was anyone who lived, slept, and dreamt the liberation of his people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it was Walter Sisuli. He spent the better part of his adult life serving humanity and later in prison for more than 26 years. Walter Sisuli was a fiercely committed activist and leader who loved his country and his people. He understood the demands of the revolution with unlimited, with unlimited clarity and therefore understood what was expected of him. He never lost sight, Honorable Chairperson, of, of the, the sight of his people, their needs, their fears, their joys, and their aspirations. That is what we need to do as his four years to transform the system of local government. Honorable Chairperson, Baba Walters, Baba Walters' passion for freedom 
and justice never eclipsed his pathos for the people. That is why he was so loved and respected by his people. And that is why he will be forever honored and remembered. And once more, may God receive his soul in peace and with joy. In conclusion, Honorable Chairperson, in honor of, in honor of Baba Sisulu and remember his birth date, we as his I'm leading members, especially I'm members of parliament, we must conduct oversight to all organs of the state under our jurisdiction, including those at provincial and government level. As members of parliament, we must monitor and oversee the executive actions, focusing on the implementations of laws, on spending their budget appropriately, on implementing their strategic plans and annual performance plans, and on strict observance of the law of parliament and the constitution, as well as the effective management of the government department. And also important, we must pass laws as this parliament, which will transform our country to make it truly non-racial, non-sexist and prosperous, just like what Walter Sisuli would have done. On those particular words, I want to say thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Thanks. Thank you very much, Honorable Godovo. Uh, the next speaker is, is going to be Honorable uh, C. Fesser. Honorable yeah. Fesser. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, thank you, um, Honorable Minister, and all protocols observed. Honorable Minister, thank you for what you've added in your speech about the municipalities in the Northwest. And I'm, I'm glad that, you've take, that you, you took note of that. But it is true that South Africans residing in ANC-governed municipalities live in appalling, slum-like conditions created by the ANC. The gradual decay of institutional values over the past 27 years has resulted in the exclusion of millions of people from accessing basic services such as water, sanitation, electricity and solid waste removal. The Annual Auditor's General Report bears witness to the regression of municipalities with increasingly unspent and unfunded budgets as well as unauthorized, irregular, business and wasteful expenditure. This downward trajectory can only be attributed to the fraud and corruption that serves as the controls that have been embedded into the core financial systems of ANC-governed municipalities. It is therefore clear that fraud and corruption has become the action plan of implementation in the governance of municipalities, not only by councils, but also by administrators. Now COFTA has a new plan on the table, the district development model printed on glossy paper and packaged as the plan that will resurrect municipalities through the building of smart cities. Minister, I foresee two problems with this plan. Over the years, COFTA demonstrated its incapacity to effectively address the dire financial straits that municipalities have collapsed in. The district municipalities have also been reduced to overstaffed and underqualified cadre deployment institutions. For 27 years, billions of rands were budgeted for, but yet ANC-governed municipalities are none the better. The ongoing gross maladministrations of these funds guarantees the deprivation of services to communities. Not one COCTA plan progressed from being tabled in councils to being implemented. If indeed these plans were actioned into implementation, communities today would not have experienced substandard living conditions that denies them of the constitutional right to a life of dignity. For 27 years, billions of rands were wasted. Checks and balances within the financial management of public funds in conjunction with consequence management, accountability measures should be reinstated and enforced with the requisite discipline by both the provincial and national governments. The disintegration of municipalities is the outcome of dismally failed oversight, and they should be held accountable for this. The invocation of section, section 139 is another example of how public funds have been flushed down the drain. And thank you for uh, Honorable Dudovu that also recognized this. Politically connected administrators are appointed without a 
determining how the institutional or statutory capacity of these municipalities must be improved. The end result, structurally destroyed municipalities with regressed audit outcomes and increased ANC political infighting. More needs to be done to identify and address the root causes of this collapse. We can no longer expect that an election will magically usher in new councillors that will automatically honour the COFTA mandate. After 27 years, the renewed ANC policy and annual performance plans maintain the promise of service delivery, developing local economic economies and creating per permanent jobs, serving communities in line with the Bartipelli principles. But this, however, proved to be a blatant lie. It never happens. Instead, ANC achieved failed policies, state capture, cadre deployment, inflated tenders, self-enrichment, nurtured systems of fraud and corruption in every administration, and weakened systems of checks and balances. But all is not lost. When the DA governs, they govern best. As the Auditor General will agree, the DA difference is evident in all DA governed municipalities and the Western Cape Legislature. All South Africans visiting the Western Cape can attest to this. The question is, what is the DA's secret? Implementation of legislation, financial discipline with checks and balances, accountability, consequence management, transparency, a clear vision of objectives to not only maintaining cities, towns, townships and villages, but economically develop developing all areas of its jurisdiction to create permanent jobs and improve the lives of all that live there. No wonder the city of Cape Town has been named by card payment provider Dojo as the third most ambitious city in the world. This honor was attributed to the innovative designers and artists that reside here. The low costs involved in opening a new business and the annual competitions held in aid of new businesses. Cape Town outperformed New York, Paris, and Singapore City in terms of entrepreneurial potential, and I am proud to say that to you today. Due to the support given to small, medium, and micro enterprises in the city, they are able to employ 70 to 80% of the working population. The stark contrast between the DA governed Western Cape and ANC governed provinces clearly indicates the ANC's indifference towards the suffering of ordinary South Africans. In conclusion, this bu budget, like all the others before, is nothing other than an effective plan to use limited resources for selfish gain. The target set in the annual performance plan is seldom reached, and this year will in all probability be no different. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Professor. Uh, I will now hand over uh, the presiding officer's role to Honorable Weningwe. Honorable Thanks Nguyen. Very, thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. The next speaker is Honorable Bartlett. Honorable Bartlett. Good morning, Honorable Chair. Good morning, Honorable Chair. Good Honorable morning. Minister. And honorable members, good morning to all. Uh, Chair, on the sector of unemployment and developmental local government, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a serious toll on not only the life of our people, but also the economy of, the South, of South Africa. We are still reeling from the effects of the lockdown. States SA announced that in the and, year 2020, uh, <laughs> that in the year 2020, in its entirety, contracted by 7% and in the second quarter, about 2.2 million people had lost their jobs. The risk adjustment strategy that is being implemented by government to fight against COVID-19 and curb the spread, the virus has not only sharpened the contradictions of poverty and uh -huh. unemployment, <laughs> which continue to characterize the structure of the South African economy, but has also exacerbated them. It is in this context, Chair, the ANC government oh. laid out and proposed to the nation an economic West. recovery oh. and reconstruction plan. Oh. This plan has three phases. Mm. Number one, to engage and preserve 
which includes a comprehensive health response oh. to save lives. How long shall it take? And this so, uh, honorable member, can you please stop a little bit? There's somebody who's disturbing. Uh, uh, Dr. D.F. Pese, can you please unmute yourself? Please, you are disturbing us. Ma'am, I have a mute also. Okay, ma'am. Okay, Honor thanks, Chair. can continue. Thanks, Chair. And secondly, the recovery and reform, which includes interventions, to restore the economy while controlling the health risk. And lastly, Chair, reconstruct and transform, which entails building a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive economy. The task of local government in the context of economic recovery and reconstruction is to unlock enablers that will allow for a pursuit of a developmental state mandate for the local economy. The localities have to come up with economic development programs which will be anchored and driven by a social compact. Amongst the key local stakeholders, such as small business, traditional leadership, youth and women groups, and other interest groups with economic recovery and reconstruction. Local government must create a conducive policy environment and mobilize resources to support economic development initiatives and also to ensure local beneficiation. By creating jobs, local procurement. One of the priorities identified in the recovery and reconstruction plan is the area of infrastructure investment. Local government has the responsibility to ensure that there is aggressive infrastructure investment in the areas. This is already a priority being implemented by the Department of Corporate Governance because infrastructure constitutes the largest spending program of their budget and economic function. This can act as a catalyst to economic growth. In order to maximize the economic impact of infrastructure projects, it is important for the states to empower local industries. This can be done empowering SMMEs, women, and cooperative and suppliers. As part of our oversight work, we must ensure that the infrastructure projects are driven to localization. Using South African suppliers, materials, and construction companies. Labor-intensive methods must be used to ensure that projects employ more people. In some ANC-led municipalities, this is already the case. For example, in the ANC-led coalition government in the city of Ekruleni, 30% is already set aside for local businesses and all infrastructure programs. While this is being implemented, we must be vigilant against corruption, nepotism, and bribes, which are paid by rent-seeking elements to repossess and repossess development so that it only benefits them alone. The local sphere of government must create a conducive environment for development of small and medium-sized enterprises. Cooperatives and startups facilitate inclusive growth. A more competitive economy will enable higher growth and job creation while providing consumers with lower prices and more product choice. Using the buying power of the states of a local level will stimulate local demand, create value change, and generate a local system of innovation in which there will be a flow of technology and information between the local players and of external players. This leads to a sustainable development. Chairperson, all these interventions will mean nothing if we fail on the core issues that must be addressed by the local sphere of government, which is the provision of basic services to our people. Municipalities are the most basic units of government and are tasked with delivering services. This is done through the mobilization of resources towards the improvement of the lives of our people. Basic services are the fundamental building blocks of improved quality of life. An adequate supply of safe water and adequate sanitation and assistance of life, well-being and human dignity. The community survey of 2019 conducted by Estates SA revealed that tremendous progress has been registered in the past few decades in the provision of basic services. The report shows that 81.9% of all households resided in formal dwellings 
although the percentage of households there they have received government subsidy, the excess housing increased from 5% in 2002 to 14% in 2019. 12 of households still live in informal settlements. This is also made complicated by the migration of patterns. Households with access to improved source of water increased from 84% in 2002 to 88% in 2019. The increases were much notable in the Eastern Cape, which increased by plus 17% percent points, percentage points, and KwaZulu-Natal 10%. Despite this notable progress, Chair, access to water actually declined in five provinces between 2002 and 2019. The largest decline was observed in Pumalanga, with five, minus 5%, five Limpopo minus 3%, and Free State minus 3%. Despite these declines, the reality is that more households had access to piped water in 2019 than 18 years earlier, Chair. While the number of households access to water in the dwelling increased by 70%, 3.2 million households between 2002 and 2019, growing from 4.5 million to 7.7 .7 million. The percentage of households with access to water in the dwelling only increased by 4.5% points of the, over the same period. Through the provision and the efforts of government support, agencies and existing stakeholders the percentage of households with access to improved sanitation increased by 20% between 2002 and 2019, growing from 61% share to 82%. Most improvement was noted in Eastern Cape, where the percentage of households with access to improved sanitation increased by 54% to 87%. At Limpopo, in which access increased by 36%, points to 63 percent, 36 points to, 30, to 63 percent. The challenges which have been highlighted by the community survey, uh, survey about water shortages should be addressed through the infrastructure investment program. This is why in order to fund new bulk water projects and maintain raw water infrastructure, spending on national water as resource management is expected to grow from 28.6 billion rent in 2020 to 2021 to 13 billion in 2023 to 2024. This should address the challenges in the specific provinces which experience a decline in water sources. Chair, this improvement in service delivery proves that we have laid a solid foundation with a developed mental state working with all key stakeholders can be able to affect economic transformation and be able to create employment opportunities in their localities. This is why it is important to have sustainable municipalities with sufficient revenue base that allows them affordable to persuade their developmental state and mandates. How we pay for services and infrastructure also affects the nature, the location, and density of development. Correct pricing will improve the efficiency with which resources are used to provide the services that residents and business want. More over chair. If cities are interested in pursuing compact development, they need to consider the impact of other financial tools, such as property taxes and development charges on how cities grow and develop. I thank you, Chair. I thank you, Chair. Thanks, eh, Honorable Member. The so, next speaker but, uh, is Honorable Matiwane. Honorable Matiwane. Honorable Chairperson, um, the National Chairperson of the NSOP, the Deputy Chairperson, the Minister of Corporate Governance and other ministers present, Deputy Ministers, Honorable members of the NCOP, good morning. Sishalo, obejek leyo sili pondo, lembu makapa. Si pagamela uwamkela le budget, vote itaka nyo minister of comparative governance and transnational affairs. Sine nginga, yoguti sili pondo, olu shashlo buwa maa lesele, 
uzakudlala indima enkulu ucule nokuba abantu nakwiphondo lethu honorable chairperson in her address the minister said the budget is meant to contribute towards eradication of poverty unemployment and inequality these three challenges are most prevalent in our province and they are not merely statistics but affect to homeboys women the elderly and youth now of, of, of our province Though we would have preferred even more resources to be allocated to the department so that it can fulfill its obligation. We are mindful of the budget cuts that have affected the department. Hence, we encourage the minister and his team to utilize the limited resources they have prudently to make a positive impact in the lives of our people. We want honorable members to applaud the role that has been played by this department in leading efforts to fight covid-19 in our country in particular with regards to the implementation of the, of the of the disaster management act and the risk adjusted strategy we know this has not been an easy task but we have eased south africans into adhering to regulations that are meant to save lives though we have lost more than 11000 lives in our province we will remain indebted in your leadership efforts chairperson on a point of order chair mathebula na le mona ma i i can only mona i'm raising a point of order ah o ama b what a point of order chair on a remember chairperson eh speaker ara le xinga ku vula vuleni picture le yi yi huma ku ka I thought as much from the Yina I thought as much ANC which is not allowed we are Yina wa Yina wa 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 cancel thank you chair oh oh Yina I number member can you please continue oi oi na a wa na on the point of order chair honorable member can you please continue thank you very much honorable chair chairperson we rely on your leadership efforts again at this crucial stage of the okay, vaccination okay. program okay. to protect our people okay. from this invisible deadly virus okay. the constituency of okay. traditional leadership and okay, local government that, that okay, person, can i raise a point of order on a point of order chair on a point of order chair on a point of order chair, order, chair. what is the point no, of no you order? must take the point of order chair person you must take the point of order chair i've read that issue and you have not ruled that's on the rules of, of the city i'm taking a ruling that the member must continue with his no, you the must member say, cannot continue i'm calling a point uh, of order yeah, person with the law of nlc there okay. Okay. Huh? Okay. tell us down my that the member must continue with uh, with his speech Well, oh, you must the he does not have the form, the official uh, background what else do you need Randu is is having a logo chair can you Honor please members, can you please allow the member to continue with his speech i'm taking the ruling Honorable chair Honorable chair yes on a point of order this sitting is to be deemed the NCOP council in Cape Town and this means that the background must indicate the NCOP and another thing when you enter the house you are not allowed to have any political party regalia So we request you to please ensure that the current speaker changes his background to the acceptable norm. Nenka makar. Eh chief we can we are taking uh, 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 the DA yes, point am, of order but don't take the ETF point of order. Chairperson. I'm raising my hand but uh, some unruly I can see your hands members. Chief. Some that yes, just speak without a reason. I'm deliberately hand. raising my hand. but some unruly honorable members speaks in tent as they wish so this house is governed by members we trying it to is correct it table. is correct that the point that is raised by honorable matibula 
that the Honorable Special Delegate could look into the background. But this is in the middle of a statement by Honorable Matiwan. So I take it, Chair, that we're going to make a ruling at the end of the presentation of Honorable Member, such that we are consistent with what we expect, that this should depict the National Council of Provinces, the background, or either a, a, a background that doesn't show any party regalia. So I believe that you will you'll guide uh, honorable members participating in the debate. Thanks. House Chair. Thanks, Chief Whip. Uh, I won't repeat again what we have said. I hope the members have heard what we have said, Chief Whip. Uh, I'll ask the honorable member, uh, Matiwane, to continue. Honorable Matiwane. Thank you very much, honorable chair. Chairperson, Chairperson, uh, chair, 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 the only hands that is up, it's Honorable April. Aplaini. Aplaini, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, ma'am, the, the point of order that the Honorable Matevula has raised is that the member, all of us were told that when we get into the meeting, it is deemed to be the NCOP house. So I really do not understand why someone would deliberately use the logo of the organization and being allowed. Because to say that this member must be allowed to finish his speech, what will happen tomorrow if I decide to get in there with the logo of my political organization? I say I'm going to say that I must finish my speech, and then we will make the ruling later. Honorable what is the need uh, of the chairperson in that if I you may. need to take you need to take you need to make a, a, a ruling, Chairperson, that this member, if he's breaking the rules of the house. Then you, you have to tell him to stop and put the lock of the uh, parliament there. Thank you very much. Honorable House Chair. Honorable Deputy Chair. Honorable House Chair. Honorable House Chair. We just want to advise. You for the we, we just wish to advise that Honorable Matiwani switches on his video, which I believe that it could solve the problem because that's a background when he is not on video. If he switches on the video, I believe that no party regalia will show. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. If you see him in the video, there is no party regalia. Can you continue, please? I can just imagine the other parties their logo on what you would have done with us. The constituency, thank you, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members. Honorable Matiwane. 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 Hon so that is given a fair chance to participate in the debate in a manner that is consistent with the rules. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, Chief Whip, I think you must do like that, seeing that Honorable Matiwane can correct himself. Uh, I'll continue with our list, our speakers list. I would like to call Honorable M. Nana. Honorable Nana. Are you sure it's me? Are you ready? Who? Chairperson. Is it you? I think there's, not, there's another speaker before me, Chairperson. Because if you are speaking, all of you, you are disturbing me. If you want to speak, raise your hands. 
Honorable my House Chair. Uh, I've raised Honorable my hand. My hand, uh, House Chair. Honorable House Chair is uh, Honorable Zanda Mella, the following speaker. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Advocate Pindela. Honorable Zambela. No, thanks, House Chair. And uh, earlier on, I thought um, uh, I'm number five on the list. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's fine, House Chair. Uh, thank you very much. House Chair. Yes, I'm listening. Now that we, we are approaching. Now that we are approaching the elections, the EFF will pay attention uh, to the ongoing uh, deterioration at the municipalities. The reality, House Chair, is that uh, we, we do not have local government anymore. The spheres of government has completely collapsed. And it is one sphere of government that was supposed to work because when our people talk about government, government and governance, they are talking about the local government. When our people want to water, sanitation, infrastructure, they want it from their municipalities. At the, uh, as the municipalities are at the cold face of the service delivery. The current design, the, the Division of Revenue Act that is used to allocate money between spheres of government and between municipalities, it's based on these false assumptions. The reality is that more than 10 million are unemployed, and those that are employed, majority and below a living wage. As a result, municipalities cannot uh, cannot raise their own revenue. And uh, I'll say that means that uh, the, equity, the equitable share conditional grant that municipalities receive through the division of revenue is the main source of economic activities in these municipalities. As we see in fighting amongst councillors, uh, municipal officials, over tenders and positions. This is how the ruling party has been able to maintain apartheid spatial planning because even municipalities such as metros who are able to raise revenue, they prioritize mostly affluent areas and uh, white uh, residents while our people in informal settlement and townships continue to live in uh, apartheid structure segments. House Chair, with uh, each year that passes, municipalities have descended deeper and deeper into state of chaos. And if we do not change the division of revenue bill, our municipalities will never be financially sound. Instead, we will continue to see hopeless disillusionment and frustrations marked by service delivery protests, violence crimes, and corruption. Instead of solving problems of poverty, eliminate inequality, and reshape our society, our municipalities do not have the capacity, and everything is outsourced through tenders. The AG's report suggests that 60% of revenue reflects to the books of municipalities will never be paid. So th those uh, monies will never be regained. And out of the 257 municipalities received clean audits, they are the district municipalities. So it's 8%. Irregular expenditure totaling to more than uh, 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 30 billion and the ANC has failed to take a firm political decision to impose strict financial controls, quality management, and good governance. This year, House Chair, the EFF, will participate in the local government elections and usher in government that will benefit our people, especially the previously disadvantaged. The EFF will expose corruption, maladministration, it is only the EFF that uh, has a believable and practical plan on job, on jobs, land, and, and capable municipalities. The EFF does not support this budget. Thank you, House Chairman. House Chairperson. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Zandela. 
Honorable members, the next speaker is Honorable Na Nana, which is number six. Honorable Thank you Nana. very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable members, the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs has a specific mandate clue to which is found in its name. So let's check how they're doing. There are three tiers of government as we all know them, national, provincial, and local. The Department of Culture is seen as a mechanism by which provincial and local government interact with the national sphere, whilst at the same time monitoring the two spheres on behalf of national government. So let's start by looking at the provinces. Gauteng has a major dispute with national government over the unilateral implementation of ETOLs. The problem continues and instead of stepping in to resolve the matter, COCTA appears to be silent spectator in a match that they were supposed to be playing. KZN government is set to be on a collision course with the national counterparts over the migration of transnet offices from Deben to Port of Nuhpa in, in the Eastern Cape. The Eastern Cape is complaining about lack of support for drought funding and the misuse of a judicial process for political gains. The Western Cape has many disputes with national government, including the deployment of police, control over rail transport, and many others. The Northern Cape is at its width, is at its width, it's at its width end with the issues around illegal mining, issuing of mining licenses and, and, and environmental concerns, with national government only following a fragmented approach. The Free State is suffering under what Honorable Mohai, the Chief Whip of the NCOP, correctly described as debilitating conflicts between spheres, yet Parliament's response was to send a letter. The list goes on, but never gets as bad never gets as bad as it does in the Northwest Province, which has under section which has been under section one hundred intervention since twenty eighteen with limited progress and less direction. It drags on with extension after another after another extension. I'm not denying the need for these extensions, but I'm just bemoaning the failure to which result to which uh, to achieve to achieve results timelessly. When one looks at the numerous municipalities under Section 139 intervention and lack of progress made, one only needs to read the reports of this House's Provincial Week to see that Doctor has failed and has failed dismally. The problem has become so bad that even our very own chairperson, Honorable Masondo, has woken up to it and it decried the abuse of Section 139 in his speech to the Salga National Members Assembly last week. This appears to have been an, this appears to have been an acknowledgement of the ludicrous treatment of Tswane municipality by the ever adventurous MEC Lebohang Mahile and the simultaneous total denial of all failures in Mfuleni municipality. Honorable members, the underlying factor seems to be the absence of the legislation called, called in section 100, subsection 3, and section 139, subsection 8. That is the legislation that would clarify why, when, and how these interventions, Honorable Dodovu, should take place and what should be the outcomes. But colleagues, I am sure you will agree with me. It is unfair to try to paint all municipalities with the same brush, because quite frankly, the D, quite frankly, DA governed municipalities are a model with which peers across the country should emulate as a blueprint of good governance and epitome of, care, of a caring government. Let's call it for what it is, members. Where the DA governs, we make the difference. If for some odd reason you are, in you are in denial of this fact, do yourself a big favor. Visit Nelson Mandela Bay or Koha municipality that both are in the Eastern Cape. These municipalities both have similar stories of being on the brink of collapse 
when the party of good governance took over. And through bold, clean, and visionary leadership, they are now the role model I have referred to above. Honorable members, it is my greatest pleasure to once again give this council a, sim a, a few snippets of the excellent work done by executive mayors of Koha and NMB respectively. In Koha, owing to the entrenched system of good governance, prevalent since the DA took over in 2016, 40.5 million has been approved for the installation of services in Hanki's 990 housing project. And over, two, over 28 million has been pumped in the resealing of roads for the past 12 months. In Nelson Mandela Bay, as of the 1st of May, 2021, 43,000 billion complaints have been resolved, much to the relief of anxious residents. 2,607 sewerage complaints were attended to. With the drought ravaging the region, NMB has, has upped its ante in the war against water leaks, as 5,526 water leaks were repaired. The city of Port Holes in Makana has a once in a lifetime opportunity to learn from NMB because in NMB, we have properly repaired 6,355 port holes. In, in gang dominated areas, the showstopper has been restored and law and order is gradually returning to the city with roadblocks becoming a common site in, in, in Nelson Mandela Bay. For the upcoming uh, provincial week, I will persuade the DA, I will persuade the Eastern Cape delegate, de delegates to visit Koha and Nelson Mandela Bay for us to see for ourselves. As Helen Suzman once said, and I quote, go and see for yourself, close quote. I have no doubt we are a matured group able to rise about, above our narrow political interests and we will put the people before the color of the t-shirt or, or the card we are carrying. Honorable Minister, on behalf of Koha and Nelson Mandela Bay, I extend a warm invitation to you to go and see for yourself. Your hosts, Executive Mayor Horatio Hendricks and Nababanga are standby, are on standby to welcome you. Thank you very much, Honorable Nguyen. Thank you, Honorable Nana. The next speaker is Honorable Ngwezi, number seven. Honorable Ngwezi. Honorable, Honorable House Chair, Honorable Ngwezi doesn't seem to be in the house. Okay, Nyabonga Advocate Pindela. Uh, I will continue with our our list. Uh, the next on, honorable is Honorable Ameri America, G America from Western Cape. Um, good good morning, our chair, and, and thank you for the privilege to address the house. Um, our chair, in his 2021 State of the Province address. The Premier of the Western Cape made a number of commitments which have a direct and indirect bearing on local government in the Western Cape. One, the Premier called on the province to lead from the front in South Africa with new ideas, with better policies, and with good, clean, and accountable government. And to provide support to improve governance in municipalities, and thirdly, to strengthen forensic investigation capabilities of the department uh, to investigate fraud and corruption in municipalities. Furthermore, he committed to coordinate implementation of the joint district and metro approach for better service delivery. And lastly, to strengthen citizens' interface in partnership with municipalities. Our chair, improving citizens' interface the Department of Local Government has been playing a critical role in strengthening the effectiveness of ward committees through supporting its establishment and providing various capacity building programs to address developmental challenges 
in communities and to ensure that key role players work towards common goal. A major campaign across the length and breadth of the Western Cape is underway using a variety of different media as well as community voices to share accurate and factual information with the, with the public on the vaccines being used. We in the Western Cape are committed in developing a comprehensive response plan to ensure our preparedness for the anticipated third and or possible fourth wave. In support of this, the Western Cape will continue with the implementation of the tried and tested hotspot approach, partnering with key stakeholders, using our communication capacity and coordinating our responses through our joint operation centers. Our chair, creating jobs is critical for our government. This year, 17,700 funded job opportunities will be created through the Community Works Program. These community development workers will continue with critical stakeholders to implement and or to support Hello, programs Hello. aimed at raising awareness about COVID-19 in communities and strengthening public participation Hello. in the vaccination program. A further 50 million ran through conditional transfers to local municipalities is made available this year for small micro-enterprises in rural areas. Municipalities are required to coordinate and ensure the implementation of targeted short-term public employment programs for communities identified as being in distress. Our chair, a capable state has meant that our governments provide a conducive environment for investment and job creation. Even, even during the pressures of a pandemic and recession last year, the city of Cape Town was able to finalize a combined amount of 7.7 .7 billion rand in investments from major global corporations, such as Amazon, Google, Amdek, Capita, and Terraco, which is a catalyst for major job generation. In addition, through the city of Cape Town strategic business partners, 8.8 .8 billion rand was raised between April and September 2020. With reference to the business outsourcing sector, a total of 6,399 job opportunities were created between January and December 2020. Chairperson, at the end of the last year, the local government department launched its municipal energy resilience project, which will assist municipalities in taking the necessary steps to generate procure and sell their own power. As part of the first phase, the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, in partnership with the Department of Local Government and Provincial Treasury, has already undertaken an assessment process with all municipalities to determine, to determine their readiness and to select those that can be initial drivers for new energy opportunities. I'll share. With the expected local government elections this year, there will be new councillors. It is important that councillors are exposed to ongoing training to ensure that they are able to discharge their responsibilities effectively. The current reality in local government is that there are a number of allegations relating to fraud, corruption, and maladministration being reported. Moreover, there have been changes in political control in certain municipalities brought about parties forging new coalitions. The past year, the department conducted several assessments in relation to allegations of fraud, corruption, and maladministrations in municipalities. And during the upcoming financial year, will continue to strengthen its capacity to conduct investigations in municipalities. Often, Councillors and the public are frustrated with the length of time which these investigations take, and rightly so. To strengthen the capacity to investigate and expedite investigations into allegations of fraud and corruption, an additional 8.6 million rand over the medium term is being budgeted. 
a clear indication of how zero tolerance approach towards corruption. Chairperson, despite our relentless efforts to root out corruption and maladministration, our tasks are often frustrated by municipalities not under control of the DA. A recent example, notwithstanding that the ANC control must become a municipality being investigated by SAU for alleged PPE for corruption, the municipality proceeded to appoint an acting municipal, municipal manager who has been released on bail and stand accused of fraud, corruption, and money laundering in criminal proceedings to be heard in the Clan William Magistrate Court. In addition, two other criminal cases against this official are before the NPA for a decision. The person, 45% of the country's clean audits are concentrated within the Western Cape. The Attorney General explains, um, the Auditor General explains that this success is owed to proper process of checks and balances having been formalized in administrations and reinforced by the presence of decisive leadership and practices which work to prevent corruption. Chairperson, this government's life to the economic hardships brought on by the pandemic on our people. This resulted in that municipalities face significant challenges in collecting rates from financially distressed ratepayers. This re further resulted in a significant revenue loss for a number of our municipalities, which impacted negatively on their cash flows. The loss of jobs associated with the pandemic has also led to an increase in our indigenous households, which municipalities must subsidize. This is a threat to municipalities as the financial sustainability largely depend upon the ability of its residents to pay the municipal for the, for the municipal services. While the resources to strengthen service delivery continue to be negatively affected, the cities continue to demand higher quality of services. This manifests itself through illegal land invasions, sustained inward migration of indigent households, protests, which often results in the infrastructure critical to service delivery being vandalized and destroyed. As we move closer to the municipal elections, this will only increase as opposition parties, political opponent opportunists, and NPOs masquerading as um, service delivery protesters and as front for certain parties attempt to destabilize the Western Cape to achieve political advantage in the election. Chairperson, many people have lost hope and due to poverty have been deprived of their dignity. To this end, the city of Cape Town continues with the COVID-19 relief efforts to the communities. Over the past year, the city of Cape Town has allocated more than 39 million rand to an emergency food relief program going above and beyond the municipal mandate to assist those who have but that have fallen on hard times due to the global pandemic and national lockdown. Over 262 soup kitchens have benefited from this program in the metro, and more than 200,000 residents now receive a warm meal daily from this soup kitchen. Chairperson, the Western Cape is committed to promote dignity amongst our people. We continue to provide a series of safety nets for those in need and making sure that the rights of basic service delivery is checked. In the Western Cape, its municipalities lead on all consumer unit metrics relating to free basic water, electricity, sewage and sanitation, and solid waste management services. Not only does this prove that our governments are efficient to deliver on its promise, but further shows our commitment to caring and to poor, poor governance. In contrast, we have seen how ancient and municipalities in the Western Cape have continued to fall into disrepute. Both of West, Cedarburg, Connerland, and Matsukama, all governed by the ANC, collectively owe ESCOM almost 90 million rand. A choice to recover stronger and together, the Ratings Africa recent report shows that the city of Cape Town remains South Africa's only metropolitan municipality to be in the financial 
stable and in good standing. Aside from Cape Town, national government would need to spend over 50 billion rand to cover the cash deficit across municipalities. Our governments outside of the Western Cape also saw successful results. For example, the Midvale municipality in Gauteng received a rating of 70%, and Chuan Essence taking over from the Angeli showed a 13% improvement in its consumer debt collection rate. On the contrary, the consequences of the ANSI leadership are increasingly failing our people. For example, both the West is the worst performing administration in the province, with a rating of just 18%. Residents will also remember that it is this very same municipality which finds itself 29.1 million rand in arrears with ESCOM. Heading to the polls later this year, residents have one of the most important decisions to make. If we are to properly recover from the pandemic and look towards a more hopeful future, the decision isn't just about loyalty to one's brand. It is equally not about continuing a tradition or being lured by unattainable promises. Rather, it is about making a mark that serves to build a courageous legacy, starting right at the grassroots of government. How each of us vote this year contributes our recovery across communities, neighborhoods, and at all municipalities who are at the coal face of service delivery. Chairperson, I thank you. Thanks very much, Honorable Member. The next speaker is Honorable Ed Toy. Thank you, Akbar Voorzitter. Minister, so in the meeste gevallen waar fonds aan die regering toe vertrouw word, word daar oorspandeer aan salarisse. Die begroting van traditionele sake laat toe dat 48.9%, dus omtrent 257.3 miljoen rand van die departementse begroting vir die komende periode aan salarisse spandeer word. According to Selga, municipalities are of the most transformed entities in South Africa. Municipalities are also the sphere of government where blatant disregard for legislation is the norm and the way of life. The new normal, as some high-placed individuals call this disruptive and destructive situations. The question is, who's to blame? It is said that by not looking, you will not see. By not asking, you will not know. And by not listening, you will not hear. By not acknowledging, you will not act. The unfortunate truth is that the minister and the executive does see the controversies, but doesn't act to hold people accountable. The minister and executive does not ask why consequence management are not implemented. The minister and executive hears the opposition's calls to caution, but doesn't seem to listen to what we are saying. According to realists, a true leader leads by example. A true leader determines the pace, the attitude, the culture of the arena in which he or she leads. Metaphorically speaking, a true leader is known by the fruit of his or her subjects. Boasting of funds to be availed to create 250,000 temporary jobs through the Community Works Program to the tune of about 4.1 billion in 2020-2021 and 4.4 billion rand in 2023-2024, where the focus is placed on labor-intensive labor practices instead of value for money. Minister, instead of focusing on cutting grass, rather utilize these workers by focusing on infrastructure infrastructure maintenance programs where portals are being filled, infrastructure being repaired. Spend the money and get a return on investment and not only votes. Minister, how can people say to them, all of them have for a three month contract to get blood to get blood to get blood and in the same way to get spog with 250,000 workers who have been given by the government. This is a government in the same way, without the value of the value for the value. Die vijf plus dagie minister gebruik hier die geleentheid om waarde toe, toe te voeg tot alle municipaliteite in Zuid-Afrika. Wend hier die werknemers aan om slaggaat in alle buurte te vol, vaardig hier aan te leer en bij te dra tot die economie, eerder as om belastinggeld te gebruik om duur stemme te koop. Minister, Salga confirmed that the amalgamation of municipalities is frowned upon and there is proof of the, fa of the failure of this amalgamation. Residents in amalgamated municipalities like J.B. Marks, the Chabotla, Makwasi Hills, Ketling River, and Maklusana in the Northwest Province feel the brunt of the lack of service delivery and experience firsthand 
what the effect of KD deployment is. The district development one plan model is not the answer. The Auditor General confirmed that the lack of political will is one of the major reasons for the financial mismanagement in municipalities. In other words, since the ANC is currently in control of most of these municipalities in South Africa, most of these municipalities are in great financial turmoil. It's clear that the ANC is to blame for the dire state of municipalities that they find themselves in, and Minister Glamini Zuma is the leader of the PEC. Underspending of funds in legislatures like the Northwest has been taking place for years, and this resulted in a lack of infrastructure maintenance, crumbling infrastructure that was supposed to have been maintained and underdeveloped uh, the neighborhoods. When MECs was questioned about the underspending in departments in the Northwest legislature, a MEC alluded that underspending is better since corruption is less when less is spent. How absurd! No corruption is supposed to take place. President Ramaphosa was in charge of cater deployment. ANC mayors were elected to municipalities. ANC MECs and premiers were appointed in legislatures and the ANC ministers took office. Now, ANC appointed administrators are appointed to intervene in ANC government municipalities and ANC led province just to be replaced by, yes, you guessed right, ANC appointed administrators again. The circle of selective governments, selective consequence management, selective persecution and selective service delivery is repeating itself. Minister Dlamini Zuma is the leader of the PAC. Akbar Voorzitter, dit is duidelijk dat die regering baie betaal om goed look, goedkoop politiek te bedrijf. Goedkoop politiek word bedrijf met duur geld, geleende geld. Die Zuid-Afrikaanse staatskas kan nie die uitgaves bekostig nie. Zuid-Afrika bevind daar self in een penari. Meer geld is nodig om onze paliteite, onze infrastructuur in stand te hou en te vervang en aan te vul, maar die huidige structuur van de regering is niet in staat om te verzekeren dat hierdie fondse werkelijk correct en dier dag aangewend word. Een geval dat in, in beperkte, doch selectieve toekenning van tenders Okay. Is it is, is, is it parliamentary for is it parliamentary for honourable member to mislead the house by saying that the ANC appoint administrators? Thank you, honourable chair. Thank you, honourable member. I uh, didn't I, I didn't hear clearly what he was saying, uh, but we'll check on the handset. Can you continue, honourable member? Thank you, Jim. The fifth plus uh, bring on op the afschaffing van rasgebaseerde toekenning van tenders. Laat toe dat kundigheid en regverdige meringdingingsproces die maatstaf is. Minister, Section 139 interventions are not the answer for municipalities. Radical transformation resulted in a lack of skilled personnel. By refusing to look, you don't see what South Africans see. By not asking, you pretend ignorance. By not listening, you argue in ignorance. And by not acknowledging your part in the downfall of South Africa, you still have not acted. You stay the leader of the pack. You are to blame. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Honorable Member. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Honorable Albert Papela, the Deputy Minister of COCTA. And after that, uh, I will invite the co chair, Honorable Nyambi, to continue with the list. Honorable Papela, can you come in? Thank you, Chairperson, Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, and the Minister of Agriculture, Land uh, Reform and uh, Rural Development, uh, Min uh, Minister Togo Titiza, Honorable Members of the NCOP, Delegates from the Provinces, Members of Provincial Executives, Representatives of uh, Traditional and Khoisan Leaders, representatives of the South African Local Government Association, senior officials of government led by the Director Generals of DCOC and NDTA, heads of institutions in our sector, ladies and gentlemen. I take this opportunity to present to the NCOP Vote 3, Cooperative Governance, and Vote 15 of Traditional Affairs. This budget is a balance between the need for business continuity the importance of funding capital within a constrained physical and budget environment and redirecting funds towards COVID-19. Our budget represents inevitable trade-offs, but our reaction has been swift. 
the told and untold damage caused by COVID-19 has left scars in our pained society. Many have lost loved ones, income, jobs, livelihoods, and businesses. However, because we are a resilient nation in possession of a fighting spirit, we dare not lose hope. To recall the words by William Shakespeare, and I quote, to be or not to be, that is the question, close quote. This calls for our current generations to survive this pandemic of COVID-19 as those generations who survived the Spanish flu that lasted from 1918 to 1920. We need to work hard towards saving lives and saving livelihoods. During these trying times, we remain grateful to the brave and fearless frontline workers whom we express our deep gratitude for the important work they continue to undertake. Honorable members, we salute all local government essential service workers who remain steadfast at the front line of our fight against COVID-19. Thanks to the everyday efforts of these workers, we still continue to have lights, clean water, refuse is being collected and most streets are clean though, albeit with a number of challenges here and there. In 2015, we committed to the finalization of the traditional and quiescent leadership bill to give effect to an important milestone in the history of our democracy, which is the recognition and affirmation of the quiescent leadership structures and communities. The year 2021 is of a particular importance for traditional and especially the quiescent communities and their leaders. The long awaited traditional and quiescent leadership act 2019 commence on the first April 2021. To fast track government, the recognition of the Khoisan communities and their leaders, the Minister of Culture, Dr. Ngosa Zanadlamine Zuma, is finalizing the process of appointing the Commission on Khoisan as required by the Act. And we expect the Commission to formalize, formally start with its work in July 2021. The recognition of the Khoisan means they will have their identity similar to the other indigenous groups in South Africa. They will also promote and protect their own customs, their traditions, and their cultures. They will establish their own communities and claim land that belongs to them for such establishments. As mentioned by the Minister of Culture, we have started with the process of provincial roadshows as part of consultation on the new legislation. The aim of this engagement with the traditional and Khoisan leaders is to really begin to look at the aspects of the law and the implementation of the law. We have visited the Northern Cape, and next week we are visiting the Free State, and other provinces are on schedule, and this will end by the end of July 2021. Honorable members, in March this year, Cabinet affirmed the resolution of the 2017 traditional and question uh, leaders in Daba on land administration and land tenure reform in communal areas hoping the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Land Reform and Communal Areas in the uh, budget speech this, uh, after this one will be able to give more details. However, this is a fundamental uh, issue that finally we are responding to the demand of the land on the, on the question of the land that they had wanted it to be transferred to communities under the custodian of traditional leaders. Cabinet resolved on the process of consultation on the question of the communal land, which started in the National House of Traditional Leaders and will be going to all other provinces led by the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. This, consult this consultation will culminate in convening the land in Daba this year. Honorable members, traditional leaders continue to play an active role in the implementation of the Agrarian Revolution Program in addressing food security and unemployment thus improving livelihoods of our rural communities. This approach will be beneficial since it requires an integral and collaborative approach, which will be about expression through the district development model and ensure alignment with the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. In February this year, the Minister of Cocta, Dr. Ngosa Zanadlamini Zuma, together with other ministers, and Ngosi Masangu, the chairperson of the National House of Traditional and Question Leaders, launch what they called the Invest Rural Master Plan. We will then have to engage 
with the traditional leaders on this effort and support this initiative to grow the rural economy for it to create jobs. Honourable members, as we are approaching the winter season uh, this year, uh, pending the COVID regulations if they get relaxed, and if the third wave is not going to be as impactful, depending on the situation, once that season is allowed, we'll then have to ensure that we are able to save and protect the lives of our young people uh, about them practicing this culture with pride. Our object as government is zero death, as one death is too many. Once the bill is signed into law, uh, uh, the cultural initiation bill, it will be able to create and establish the national initiation oversight committees and the provincial initiation coordinating committees and their functions. The law will punish wrongdoing, such as the illegal schools, with the minimum and maximum sentences to be imposed on the perpetrators. We hope this will clean up all wrongdoing. On the Commission on Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Cultural, Religious, and Linguistic Communities, we want to commend the work done by the ACRL, who did the investigation of commercialization of religion, uh, which report was submitted to the fifth parliament, when we hope that the sixth parliament will be able to reintroduce that report and consider it. We hope for the recommendation will be submitted to parliament to start the, to engage with the religious leaders on harmful religious practices. Lastly, to also encourage the, the CRL to go continue investigating incidences that are undermining our cultures, such as the incident that happened at the Boulder Shopping Center in Midrand Gauteng. Uh, local government is the heart of the lives of the people of South Africa. It is where we get the water we drink, the electricity we use, the roads we drive in, the parks that our children used to play. It is about building healthy, lively communities. We remain committed to this particular idea. Honorable members, the Deputy Minister of Finance and myself uh, have been visiting provinces on a roadshow, meeting with the premiers and the members of the Provincial Executive Council. The aim is to engage with the provinces to bring about a better functionality of municipalities to ensure that they perform and discuss, uh, di di discharge their mandate of governing and delivering services. These engagements with ESCOs are to ensure that the national and provincial government give maximum support as stipulated in Section 154 of the Constitution. The aim is for an early intervention before the municipality is in crisis when we intervene. And then we always use Section 139. We need to avoid going there. Secondly, it was for us to introduce to provinces the Intergovernmental Monitoring Support and Interventions Bill, and which is still in the cabinet processes. And once concluded, the bill will be sent to Parliament for consideration within this financial year. Uh, honorable members, the minister has also tasked me to lead the service delivery enhancement task team, as she had already reported and we will indeed be engaging on and helping those municipalities that are not spending on the municipal infrastructure grant. We wish to encourage members to support budget vote 3 and 15 to enhance the departments in building for a real safe, sustainable, prosperous, and growing communities. And Steve Biko said, and I quote, a people without a positive history is like a vehicle without an engine. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Deputy Minister Babela. I will now invite uh, Honorable Parautense. Honorable Parautense. Thank you very much. House Chair, thank you for the opportunity. Honorable Minister, this Department, Corporate and Governance and Traditional Affairs is quite possibly the most inappropriately named in South Africa. Well, at least it's the first two bits. There is nothing concrete about it, and the lack of governance endures as a sad reality. The blunt truth is that the great minds who labored on the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, now 25 years old, would be shaking their collective heads at the abuse of their work. Our Constitution creates three spheres of government, national, provincial, and local, with the idea that each would be beholden to each other and would cooperate in the best interest of South Africa. What has transpired over the years is nothing better than a feudal system of fiefdoms where mayors and municipal managers and municipalities are autocratic kings and queens, arrogant in their belief that they have the right to rule on their terms and to hold the rest. 
This is drawn out by the states of municipalities across the province, which I represent in this house. The entire Kuduru district municipality suffers from an ongoing major water crisis, which plagues over 200,000 residents. Health facilities, industry, agriculture, and tourism have been severely affected, leading to over 30,000 direct or indirect job losses. The municipal manager, suspended on allegations of corrupt activities, has now left with a parting gift of six months' salary. In Moyangale, the mayor of financially crippled Mpofana advised this house in 2019 that the MFMA was an example of legislative over-regulation. The neighboring Mgeni municipality is no different and has a municipal manager in place to ANC connections, not suitable qualifications. She is flat time here. FMA in regard to the fleet management, which has led to fruitless and wasteful expenditure of over 1 million rand per month. 300,000 was spent on repairs to a truck, which is still not, that is still has not been on the road since 2014 and is still not functioning. She also aided and abetted a fuel fraud scam, which officially used municipality petrol cars to fill their own private vehicle. She rules over the finance committee with the royal mayor in secret and will not have any, divulge any information to the council. And then we have the example of the Inkosa Zani Glamini Zuma municipality in Underbury, a painful reminder that a good name can be ground into the dust. Let me be clear, House Chair. Questionable COVID regulations are for the minister. For the minister. Yes. 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 all issues at all hours of the night and early morning. Her legacy is, however, being completely disrespected by the municipal manager in NDZ, Mr. Nkosi Yezre Vezi. A point of yes. order, Chair. Frontier top of town. On the foot Honorable Brighton said. Honorable Brighton yes. said. Yes. Your, your audio is a little bit problematic. I don't know whether we, you, there's something that is interfering with it. I don't know how it can be assisted. Uh, I thought is it's it on my side. Okay. And, hello? Is it we also don't hear him, Chair. Uh, change it a bit. Chair, now? It's still very bad. Uh, Chair, I'm not sure. Um, my connection, I'm connected. <laughs> Try uh, to switch off your video, maybe it could help. Can well, you switch I, off the video? Let's see after you switch off the video. Chair, thank you very much for your assistance. I've turned it off. Does that improve it a bit? It's not improving. I will. That is problematic. Yo. Is, it, is it still, still bad? It's extremely bad. Sure, sure. Chair, I don't know if I can be given an opportunity or if I can carry on. What is your ruling? Uh, try to carry on and see if, uh, whether there will be an improvement. I suppose what you have a problem. Okay, Chair, let me, let me go back to the beginning of this paragraph. And then we have the example of the Nkosizana Klamini Zuma municipality, a painful reminder that a good name can be ground into the dust. Let me be clear, House Chairperson. Questionable COVID regulations aside, I have great respect for the Minister. She has an amazing work ethic and has personally assisted me solve issues at all hours of the night and early morning. Her I legacy... want to afford that, Chair. Chair? Hello? We, we, we can't hear this thing. We can't hear him. Uh, we, we don't hear him now. So it's a waste of time because we, we, are, we are not hearing the thing. We can't hear him. Honorable Brighton said, I don't know whether we can table uh, the speech because uh, it's a difficult situation, not unless there's any other person that can read it on your behalf. Otherwise, the audio is terrible. I do apologize, Chair. It wasn't my intention to have bad audio. You know how these things work. Technology is failing us. Yeah, no, I'm very sorry. It's technology that is uh, interfering with your audio. And uh, is it I don't know whether... 
Is it improved at all, Chief? No. Is it an issue of a Bluetooth connection of the speaker? No, it's a, it's a Wi-Fi connection I have. Yeah. And every day you have to for the bully. Now, if I don't... I can disconnect and reconnect. Maybe I can come in after the next speaker. Would that be all right? Yeah, yeah. Try to disconnect and uh, connect. You'll come back after Honorable Nkosi. Let's allow Honorable Nkosi. Honorable Nkosi, try to connect Honorable Parinsa and then reconnect. And then once you are done with Honorable Nkosi, I'll come back to you. Let's have Honorable Nkosi. Honorable Nkosi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, greetings to the Honorable Ministers. The deputy, deputy minister, <laughs> um, the chief whip, honorable members, permanent delegates, and the special delegates. Chairperson, building a capable state characterized by transparency, good governance, and accountability at local government. Honorable Chair, the development health seeks to effect economic transformation reduce inequality, de-racialize de the economy, ensure state participation in strategic sectors, including partnership with the private sector, deepen affirmation action, advance the employment of blacks, and in particular women. Furthermore, an effective developmental state is required to provide incentives for private sector behavior including clamping down on anti-competitive behavior and the promotion of competitive markets to open up the economy for new players, strengthening the monitoring of labor protection, employment equality requirements, and PEE compliance, identifying and removing regulatory er areas that impede private sector investment, and collaborating to ensure increased export of investment and export of manufacturing goods and services. Local government plays a critical role in the developmental agenda that is imagined by the developmental state as spelled out in the, in the, in the NDP. This is because it is in the local phase of, is in the coal phase of service delivery and is the first point of contact that people have with the government. Local government provides critical basic services such as water, sanitation, electrification, housing, recreational facilities, keeping communities clean, and many other services to the people. The provision of these services is a critical public investment that also acts as catalyst for socio-economic transformation as it also provides an incentive for private sector and other transformation as it also provides an incentive for provide for private sector and other players in the localities to to also invest to also invest in other words the provision of basic services is in itself an investment made by the state in leading the overall developmental agenda the anc led government has registered tremendous progress in the dem democratization of south africa and providing success to basic service delivery, which and provide service, basic services which improve the quality of life of our people. The community survey of 2019 points the reality that in the last few decades, South Africa has increased access to basic services such as water, sanitation, electrification, and all others. The success owes to the ANC's various policy interventions over the years in the local government. This has laid a solid foundation for socio-economic transformation. However, as the ANC, we are fully cognizant of the reality of the challenges which comfort local confront local government. The task of building a capable state has been the most daunting at the local sphere. These challenges which confront us as municipality include toxic relations uh, between the administration and politicians, this train service delivery, political infighting within some municipalities, 
crucial vacancies are not filled. Sometimes vacancies such as municipal manager or chief financial officer are not filled for a long time of period. In some municipalities, uh, incompetent and in some municipalities, incompetent and underqualified people are hired because of nepotism. Strengthening good governance and accountability in local government. Governance. Honorable members, politically and ethical leadership is vital to success in governance. The ANC fully understands that all political parties have responsibility to play an oversight role and promote transparency and accountability in local government. The political and administrative interface at a local government is necessary and yet com complicated challenges of local government. It is necessary to define the parameters of political leadership such that it doesn't interfere with the administration functions of local government and causes an abuse of funds and exacerbate other challenges which have engulfed the local government such as nepotism. Changes of councillors and the loss of valuable experience pose, poses another significant challenge in exercising political oversight work. The exit of experienced councillors means that institutional capacity is eroded and we must start from scratch in building oversight capacity in this regard. The Department of, Govern of Cooperative Garden Governance should continue to support councillors and the department should be prepared to train and support councillors after the 2021 local government elections. The ANC believes in the principle of continuity and change, but has experienced alarm in areas where, where there is a much as 70% turnover of councillors, eroding institutional memory. At the same time, introducing young and energetic institutions, councillors uh, with the requisite capacity and skills is very necessary. Sound financial management and accountability in the state. Chairperson, the Auditor General in the report titled Not Much to Go Around, Yet Not the Right Hands at the Till, which look at the state of financial management in local government, highlighted some of the weaknesses of um, management in local of the weaknesses of governance structures and systems on financial management. Arising out of the Auditor General's report are the following issues. Only 20 out of 257 municipalities achieved a clean audit, pointing to financial management such as wasteful expenditure, irregular expenditure and non-compliance uh, with legislation. In viable municipality, no revenue collection and over-reliance on the equitable share. Lack of human resources, critical vacancies such as municipal managers and CFO are not filled on time. The report of the Auditor General also raised a major concern that some of the challenges in local government center around human resources. The main cause of wasteful expenditure is that municipality spend large sums of money on financial consultants and yet at the same time retaining a high salary bill. The development and retention of well-capacitated human resource is critical in the quest to building a capable state, especially a development state that is interacting with market forces and seeks to champion the developmental agenda. Government interventions such as, such, such as Section 139 of Municipal Management, Finance Management Act, Management Act are one of the mechanisms of government to intervene in addressing financial challenges in local government. These interventions require continuous strengthening such that they don't become ad hoc, undefined, and in most circumstances, this intervention take place when municipalities are already in a weak position. This results in intervention not making the desired outcome an impact. The research by the, by the Treasurer and on Section 139 interventions concurs with our observations. The main recommendation of this research paper titled Mind the Gap is that what is required to tighten implementation of financing of financial warning systems is one of the overarching legislation that can be owned by 
both COCTA and Treasury and includes appropriate parts of existing legislation, legislation, including the MFMA. That will guide the entire intervention framework. This legislation needs to address the following uh, key issues. It must ensure that Section 139 is implemented as intended, uh, keeping in mind both the spirit and letter of the law. This implies that Section 139 is no longer seen as an intervention of last resort when a municipality has collapsed, but as a framework to prevent such collapse. Standardized and clean regulation of the entire Section 139 framework, including the provision of clean definition and the development of detailed threshold levels across a range of indicators. Contradictory regula regulations such as certain paragraphs of Chapter 3 of the MFMA must be revised so that there is one clear and unambiguous framework. Standardized and transparent administrative practices must be introduced across all types of interventions. Lastly, supporting institutions must be strengthened. Fighting corruption and restoring public confidence in the state. Chaperson, at the center of our challenges in our municipality is, is the scourge of corruption, which has become endemic in our society. It is the responsibility of the developmental state to lead the fight against corruption by purging itself of all elements which undermine development. The ANC has drawn a line in the, in the sand on the endemic challenge of corruption and a culture of no consequence. Governance, structures, and accountability in local government is central in addressing the challenge of, of corruption, which steals from the poor and leads to the underdevelopment. The National Conference of the ANC in 2017 came out strongly against corruption and, I, and identified it as a strategic enemy to the creation of a non-racial, uh, non-sexist and truly democratic society. We resolved that all leaders who are charged with corruption should step aside from their responsibilities pending finalization of their cases. This resolution is being implemented as you are all aware that all public representatives at all levels who are charged with corruption and other serious crimes are being requested to step aside. This demonstrates the, the seriousness with which the ANC takes corruption. Lastly, Chair, building a capable and competent human resource in local government. Honorable Chairperson, the development and retention of a capable and competent human resource in local government is of great importance. Building human capital through investment in education or bursary schemes in the medium to in the medium to long term yields yields positive results in making the local government as a player in the developmental agenda. This will allow it to work towards the growth and sustainability of the local economy. We are striving towards a capable human resource in local government as you conclude ability to be innovative and resolve modern day challenges of the locality in a manner that saves time, energy and resources. This means that it can foster a culture of specialization and focus on a rest. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Nkosi. Honorable Broughton said, are you winning? I certainly hope so, Chair. Can you hear me? It's better, much better. Chair, thank you very much for your kind indulgence. I will now go back to the speech. Thank you so much. Honourable Minister, uh, this You department... start from where you were commending the Minister. Where I was? Commending the Minister. <laughs> did, did you hear everything before that? Okay, let me go to the Yes, you start from that paragraph when you are commending the Minister. <laughs> okay, Chair, let me get there. All right, Chair, I'll start off from here. Um, after dwelling on the Ugu District Municipality and Moyo yes, Farmer, yes. I will... the... All right. And then we have the example of the Nkosazane Glamini Zuma Municipality. A painful yes. reminder that a good name can be ground into the dust. Let me be clear, Honorable House Chairperson. 
Questionable COVID regulations aside, I have great respect for the minister. She has an amazing work ethic and has personally assisted me solve issues at all hours of the night and early morning. Her legacy is, however, completely disrespected by the municipal manager in NDZ, Mr. Nkosiezwe Vezi. He has created a wild west frontier type of town in the foothills of the Drakensberg Mountains. Water and electricity disruptions are numerous. The town has become the scene of drunken act antics, including wild drag racing, public indecency and prostitution. Potholes litter the town like craters from a war zone. Waste dumps pile high with hazardous materials brought in by eco-criminals from Johannesburg. Millions are spent on projects that are either left incomplete or contractors are removed for incompetence. There is no transparency whatsoever in municipal decisions and when residents, including engineers, doctors, advocates and leading business people raise queries, Vesey dismisses them as colonial racists. And when these professionals offer their assistance mahala, they are ignored or told to keep their mouth shut. The heartbreaking part of this tale is that when the minister visited with one of the prominent residents and stakeholders in the town recently, she had to admit that there was not much she could do about it. And so this dim-witted demagogue does not cooperate, does not govern, and disrespects the name of a respected minister because of the abuse of the system allows him to do so. And so where is Cocte in all of this? They are silent. Rather than altering the balance of power through legislation, or simply moving against those backed actors, they prefer to remain to retain the support of these actors and their votes and encourage these local feudal lords to see themselves as royalty. And so these fiefdoms continue to crumble until one day the people will see that the emperor has no clothes and demand Old Testament style revenge, revenge and justice. Che, it is customary in a sweep that I refocus on some of the comments made earlier. The minister spoke about the glowing examples of how Etiquini municipality is doing well, but she obviously does not know that at the moment they have 16 days available of cash. It was one day available of cash in February, and they have a 15 billion rand debt, only 10 billion rand of which is collectible. My colleague Mlindi Nana listed a lot of fantastic examples of how the DA governs and governs well. And then our friends from the EFF say that they have the only alternate plan. Well, I'm sorry to my EFF friends, but that alternate plan is simply fantasy because you've never governed anywhere and you don't know what you're talking about. Chair, in many municipalities, we are coming close to power. In Moipofana, we are only 9% away. We are coming. The day is coming fast when the ANC will reap the whirlwind. Waza, 27 October. Waza. See ya, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, thank you. Thank you for assisting us by sorting the network. Thank you. It's good to have your voice in order because we don't want any member to be deprived of an opportunity to make his uh, view in this very important debate. Let me take this opportunity now and invite the Honorable uh, Minister of Cocta, Dr. Lamini Zuma. Honorable uh, Dr. Minister. Honorable Zamini Zuma. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Am I audible? Uh, chap sorry, Chairperson. Am I audible? Mm. Yes. Yes, you're audible. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank all the members who have participated in this debate from all the political parties and the provincial reps. I want to j just agree with what the chairperson of the select committee has said about how we are going to work and how we're going to be uh, monitored uh, quarterly and, and everything that he has said. Uh, so I also agree with the other ANC members uh, the uh, representative from the Pumalanga also dwelt a lot on the corruption issues. So I, I agree with them. Let me come to the EFF, uh, Honorable Zander Mela. 
I also agree with him when he says that we must change the Division of Revenue Act. Uh, indeed, we have been at pains in discussing with Treasury on this matter because we do agree that the municipal, the municipal revenue division uh, should be changed so that poorer municipalities and rural municipalities can have to better can have better access to resources so that they can be able to hire the necessary skills they need, whether it's uh, engineers, planners, and so on. Uh, but I don't know where he gets the confidence that they are going to win the elections, local government elections, because that has not been evident uh, during these by-elections that we have seen recently. Uh, let me also thank the, the last speaker for acknowledging uh, the work ethic, uh, but um, we will have to... I, I agree uh, there are challenges in the NTZ municipality. Um, and I've I worked with him some time to try and resolve them. Uh, let me then come to uh, Honorable Dutoit. Uh, indeed, uh, he's correct about the CWP that uh, we are not getting value for money. And we have acknowledged that ourselves. And it is for that reason that we have said we want to remodel the CWP so that, first of all, people who are in the CWP don't spend all years and years in the CWP. They get trained, they get uh, skills that they can use to get jobs or to create jobs but also to use those skills to assist develop communities. For instance, they could be paving the roads in the communities, they could be fencing the fields and so on. So I, uh, in terms of CWP, that's what our plans are. And then let me, uh, before I lose a lot of time, let me also uh, talk to what uh, the Honourable uh, Fisser and Honourable Nana from the DA have said. Uh, I want to first say that the triple challenges that are facing this country are poverty, unemployment and inequality. And South Africa uh, is known for inequality and for poverty and we are try to address that, which is a legacy that comes from far. But we also know that poverty declines with rising levels of education, because education is, an, is, is the fastest equalizer. But let's see what the DA is doing in terms of education. Right now, the Western Cape is being taken to court for not placing thousands of kids in school. And that should be, that's criminal. How can you not be placing kids in school? And that shows that the DA doesn't care. If you can't care for young kids and make sure that they have a places in schools, you, have, you haven't cared for those kids. And that's why people are now resorting to the courts. And you can't be proud and tell us you are well run when kids are not at school in terms of education, because that's how you measure whether a government cares or not, by the way it treats its children. So you should be hanging your heads in shame for that as the DA, instead of telling us that you, you, you are the best you run your municipalities in the best way. Let me also ask the DA to tell us why in the whole continent of Africa and in South Africa, Cape Town, which they boast about as the best run, is number eight in the world in terms of violent crime like rape and murder. Why is it so? 
they must tell us. There's no other country in Africa, let alone in South Africa, that is in the top 10 in the world for these crimes. And interestingly, Nana has been, Honorable Nana has been boasting about the Nelson Mandela Bay, that uh, it's run by the DA and it's one of the best run DAs. Again, interestingly, Nelson Mandela is the second city in the world for these violent crimes. It's number 24 in the world, it's number two in Africa. It, it follows Cape Town. The TA must tell us why, what has gone wrong with their best run municipalities? What has gone wrong? Why are they high in rape and murder? And of course, we know why, but they must tell us. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable uh, Chairperson of National Council of Provinces. We, we can tell you, Minister, the, the reason is your legacy. Are, our, it's it's, it's no, the ANC no, government no, 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 who created no, 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 it, Minister. We our, can tell you. our people are responding to the DA very well. In the last by elections, the DA has hey, lost word to the ANC. It has lost word to other parties because people can see through the DA. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, honorable members, allow me to Ali take this way. opportunity. To thank <coughs> other members, allow me to take this opportunity to thank uh, Minister of Cocta, Honorable Dr. Lamine Zuma, the Deputy Minister, Honorable Bapela, Special Delegates. Uh, we know that we have another important debate. We thank you, Minister, for availing yourself uh, for this important budget vote in the NCOP. Honorable members who are adjourning for strictly 30 minutes will be back at quarter past to start the second debate. Strictly uh, the, the, a break. We're taking a break for 30 minutes a comfort break, lunch, and then we're back in, after 30 minutes. We're starting at quarter past uh, immediately after that 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, House Chair. See you Thank you.